Welcome to Superheroes of Science. I'm Steven. And I'm Sarah. We co-host Science from the Experts. Our guests are professionals doing cutting-edge science right now. They are experts in their field discussing what they know best. So listen up and learn real science from real people. Subscribe now and stay informed of our latest episodes and show your support. Joining us today for Superheroes of Science, we're here with Professor Eugene Spafford from the Department of Computer Science here at Purdue University. So welcome, and we are excited to learn a little bit about cybersecurity. Great. And, yeah. <laughs> so maybe to start with, yeah. Go ahead. What, it, what is the field? Yeah. <laughs> like, do you want to start? Okay, fine. We know I was like that questions, but I'm letting you have yeah. your <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the field of cybersecurity. Sure. So cybersecurity, is relatively recent as a field. It only goes back about 50, 60 years. And it is intended to encompass all the things we do to try to protect computer systems and the data on the computer systems, protect the privacy, keep things like computer viruses out, keep hackers away. Uh, but it includes more than just the software and the hardware. It also includes things like the legal environment around computing, or and that includes things like investigating uh, after an incident has occurred. Mm -hmm. We might have law enforcement trying to find out who planted that virus on your computer system. Mm -hmm. It includes well, education, one of the things we do here, uh, advanced research. It involves uh, privacy research, finding new ways to uh, encode information to help protect people's personal information. And all in all, there, there's about 40 or, or more specializations in the area of cybersecurity all around this idea. It, we, that seems very broad then. Um, it, if someone's just kind of interested in cybersecurity, how do you determine what area they might end up wanting to go to? Well, we don't try to steer people towards a particular mm -hmm. thing. Uh, we try to expose them to the array of possibilities and let them find what really intrigues them. So we've had some students, for instance, that uh, when looking at how computing systems are built and how uh, people break into computer systems, have decided they're really interested in how to investigate when something happens, how to take it apart, how to respond. And then we provide them with coursework and direction in doing that. Mm -hmm. I've had some students who've taken my computing courses who have gotten very interested in the whole aspect of how do we build policies and laws around that? And they've gone on to uh, law school. Oh. So that's uh, another career, but it's involved with cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. We need people who look at the broad scope of all of what goes on. Right. And it is an evolving field all the time because the hardware is changing, the software is changing, the the people who are trying to do bad things on computers are constantly coming up with new ideas. And so we're always looking for something new and people with training to do it. How do you stay up on all of the new trends? Yeah, I like <laughs> like that question. You... <laughs> because it seems overwhelming. Well, it is. Um, I don't think there's anyone who's up to date on every aspect of it because it is such a big area. But similar to anything else where uh, you're going to have a career, you're going to look at physics or chemistry or medicine, you have to be reading, you have to be paying attention to the news. Um, and most careers like this involve some, some lifelong learning. And that shouldn't be something that's scary. Uh, because sometimes that learning is finding really new and interesting things to do. It's uh, uh, We find that people, for instance, who like puzzles are really good at cybersecurity. And so just imagine a career where you're learning new puzzles and, and new tricks and you're, you're off with other people who are also interested in those things. We have conferences, for instance, in classes, and they're, they're not... They're not like sitting in a classroom. Mm -hmm. It's it's more studying the material to find out, well, what is new and how can I use it? Now, so are we going to ask about the ethical hacking then? Yeah. Are we still going to ask about that? Go ahead. Because right? I, I guess I, I do want to go kind of through just a little bit explaining, because I've heard people talk about ethical hacking. I'll be honest, I didn't know really what it meant, and I still don't. I'm not sure I had actually heard the term. I didn't know if there could be ethical I mean, 
I assumed yeah. it just meant like what I've seen in the movies where people are testing a bait security. Yeah. yeah I assume that's what I meant. That was yeah. it. Very close. Seems like it's probably a little bit bigger than what I... Well, one of the one of the truths about cybersecurity is we can never get it perfect because every system is a little different. And as I said, things are changing. Uh, there are also just some limits as to what we can do with computers and with the people who use them. So we try our best to build our defenses with our computer systems. But when they're in place, we have to monitor them and keep them up to date. One thing that some places do is test the security. They hire people, maybe they have them on staff or maybe they hire them outside, mm -hmm. to come in and try and break into the systems. Now, this is different than criminals trying to break in mm -hmm. because these people are hired and they're given permission to do so. Mm -hmm. So this is normally called ethical hacking. And this is where someone tries to break through the defenses to find, did the people who put it together do it correctly? Did they think of everything? Or is there something that they've missed? And so the idea behind ethical hacking is kind of a double check to make sure that whoever built and is running the system is doing it in a way that's really protecting the, the resources that are there. So what types of things might they be trying to break into, like, like finding a password or breaking into um, an account, or is, is, is it all kind of the same thing? Is it all password-based or? Um, no. So ethical hacking has, has different components to it. Mm -hmm. There are some who specialize in software, and they try to find where the software hasn't been updated. Oh, or bad passwords were in place, as you noted, or uh, uh, someone forgot to turn something on. That's one kind of ethical hacking. Another kind, and it, this is not done as often, but this is where people are testing the uh, people and procedures around the computer system. So, for instance, coming up to an office building, uh, carrying a couple of pizza boxes in a Domino's uniform and seeing if people will let them in without checking their ID. Yeah. And if they can get in, well, then they can get access to the network and the computers. Oh. Uh, and that's a problem. Yeah, I know my son had interned somewhere and someone was coming up behind him to walk in and he just let the door shut. And some of the people who worked there, the programmers, like, what is wrong with you? Why are you doing that? And he's like, I don't know him. And he just kept on walking because they did have to have a reason to be there. It was legitimately a delivery yes. person. But he didn't know. He wasn't going to take a chance. But it's he was really curious about after that, the social engineering side of the computer side. So the, uh, another, another really common one, for instance, is uh, somebody calling up the help desk on the weekend and pretending to be an executive and saying, I can't get in, I have to get in, there's a proposal due, would you reset my password and tell me what it is? If somebody falls for that, they're able to get in without actually trying to break the password, uh -huh. but that's a security problem and that's part of cybersecurity. And so we have people who will test that, that's a form of ethical hacking, but we also have people who are trying to build systems and teach people not to fall for that. Mm -hmm. So really, the cybersecurity is a, a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk, for instance, about uh, having a strong password or not clicking on links in your email that come from someplace you don't know about, right. well, there's different approaches there. One approach is let's design the system so even if you do by mistake, it doesn't cause a problem. Oh. There are uh, parts of cybersecurity where we build uh, programs and systems to monitor in case someone does it by accident. Mm -hmm. And then we also have those who try to do it to test whether the systems work. So we have a full range of activities, but they're all designed towards, can we protect the computing systems? Can we protect the data on the computing systems? And really, can we protect the people in the businesses using the computing systems. Mm -hmm. So, why, I mean, I, I want to ask, why do we need uh, um, cybersecurity? Why are people trying to get data? What? Yeah. Wow, well, there's a lot of reasons why someone may want to get into the data or get the computing systems. Um, at the very simplest, and, and this is 
kind of what you see in maybe movies or you hear stories are uh, the board people who are trying to just see if they can do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a very small number anymore. But if you think about where computing is used, it's used in banks and hospitals, mm-hmm. police stations, national governments. So the data that's stored there is of interest to people who might want to get financial data or corrupt it. So those are thieves. Those are criminals. They might want to get access to health records because they're going to use that for extortion to blackmail or find out about someone. Uh, They may want to get access to police records because, well, so some of the criminal gangs want to know if there's a confidential informant or someone who's what evidence is available. Mm -hmm. And then national governments are definitely involved in this. We have problems with several governments around the world trying to get in and find information about our industry, our government, and our people. So lots of reasons, Mm -hmm. lots of different parties that are out there, different motivations. Uh, If you've heard about ransomware, that's a huge problem right now, where criminal gangs will get into systems and uh, either encrypt the data and offer to give a key to give it back for a price. Or what's happening more often now is they're selling the data or asking for a price not to sell the data. And that's a big business for some criminal groups right now. Uh, Other places where this is used, people break into computing systems to use the computing power to mine cryptocurrency. So your your computer, someone might break in because they want to use the, the processing power mm-hmm. to uh, um, basically mine, it's called, but to, to create a cryptocurrency. Or maybe they're going to use your system as a place to store stolen information or use it to um, uh, send out uh, unsolicited ads or or damage somebody else's system, they don't want to do it from their own because that would get them caught and get them in trouble. But if they can find an unprotected system somewhere, they'll use oh, that wow. and get somebody else to get blamed. So there, there's a lot more reasons why. But basically, you think what you have is a computing resource, maybe a network resource, and whatever data you have. Even if it's just your own personal data, you've got credit card information, right. bank information. That's worth something to someone. As a whole, how safe is the general public with the secu- the cybersecurity measures that we have now? Like if I'm doing some online shopping or something and I've put in my credit card and I've done this, how is it? Am I just, because I've done this one time, am I now completely open to just losing everything or it, generally speaking, how safe? Generally pretty safe. Most of the merchants, most of the big banks, Um, have good security in place Mm -hmm. as of right now. uh, As I said, things change. And five years ago, ransomware was not a big issue. Okay. And it is, it is more of an issue now. Uh, But that's not only just on the computer. That's also because many of those criminals are operating from countries where we can't reach with law enforcement. Uh, so that cybersecurity is, includes that other part, mm-hmm. which is also the legal aspect. But generally, if you're communicating with a merchant using your credit card number, it's pretty safe. Not 100%, mm-hmm. but it's it's largely safe. The biggest threat you probably have is more of your privacy. So if you're using social media, mm-hmm. if you're shopping at one of these sites, they're collecting your information, what you look at, what you're purchasing your address, your other information. And then they're selling that to advertisers. Oh. And so that's that's really big business. That's billion dollar business in the US alone. But that aspect is is an issue that makes some people uncomfortable because it's violating your privacy. Mm-hmm. And some people just don't want that. But uh, uh, from a safety standpoint, from having your information stolen, that's unlikely. So I like how you started with 
oftentimes people that do well in cybersecurity are, mm-hmm. they're, they're like puzzles. They're learning puzzles. Because I'm running through my head thinking, what is all the science behind cybersecurity? What is involved with that? And it, it seems like a lot of it is one puzzle after an ever changing puzzle. It seems like that's mainly what we're doing is trying to solve one mystery after another. What uh, I, I guess I'm asking what uh, what all's in, involved with that? That is such a lousy way to form that question, but that's the best I can come up with at the moment. Like how do you prepare for something like yeah, that? Like that's a, much better. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a great question, really, and because the field is so large, mm-hmm. there are many different kinds of preparation. Uh, at its heart, a lot of it is computing. And so understanding some of the skills to be good at computer science, computer engineering are important. And that is understanding some about how to write programs, uh, mathematics, language skills. Um, Those are all important there. Mm -hmm. People don't have to be expert at those, but it helps to be good at them and to practice, a lot of practice. Uh, then there are other aspects. Uh, so, f- for instance, some of what we look at is psychology. And therefore, if someone wants to get involved in the, the human aspects of security, uh, what I was talking about where it's social engineering mm-hmm. about trying to, then, then studying sales and psychology can be helpful to someone there. That's a different kind of preparation. The ability to think in a structured way to sort of say, if this happens and then this happens and this is true, then here's the result, is is really at the heart of a lot of what we do, but not all of it. We have people who are outstanding in cybersecurity whose training is as artists, musicians, um, and we can't really say that there's one specific way to do it. And, and I notice your look when I say, for instance, musicians. Yeah. But if you think about music, it's structured. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? You have melodies, you have certain ways that things occur. Yeah. And the good musicians are the ones who practice it and sort of think of new melodies in their head. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we also have some musicians who are really good at, at breaking out of the conventions of music. Um, and coming up with something totally new. Those kinds of thinking, when applied to computing, can result in someone who's very good at security. Mm -hmm. This goes across multiple disciplines. And so if we have a student or someone who's going to work in the area who didn't necessarily get a computer science degree or Mm -hmm. doesn't think they're great at math, that isn't necessarily going to stop them from being involved in this, uh, because if they're if they're interested in solving problems, if they're interested in how things work, that's really the important part. Is there a particular computer language that would be more important for me to learn if I wanted to go into cybersecurity? Then is one more important than the other that would help me? Um, if you were going to go into the field over the next five years, mm-hmm. then there are probably two or three languages that would be really best if you were going to study them. Uh, Python is one. Rust is another language that would be very valuable to learn. But we keep coming up with new languages and new environments. And there's some discussion that perhaps the new AI systems that are coming out, uh, we don't even need to know those languages as much. I I don't believe that, but that's an argument. And so if you're going to want to be involved in programming and doing some things in in cybersecurity that involves coding, it's probably better to get a foundation in programming generally so that you can learn new languages as they become available, as they become necessary. Why does the field keep coming up with new languages? 
Uh, it's a great I, question. I mean, okay, I've heard of DOS. There was DOS. You know, yeah. and, and I expected you were going to say, as I was guessing, my like, all right, he's going to say uh, I was guessing C++. Python. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, C++. Maybe maybe. Python, yeah. C++. Do they still need to know Java? Maybe Java. I'm yeah. thinking these, and you come up with Rust, which is something I've never heard I've of. I've never heard of Rust. This is the first. And so yeah. why are these languages keep changing? Um, so part of it is that the computers keep changing. If you think about the computers we're using now compared to the computers 30 years ago, 30 years ago we were using old PCs and big hulking mainframes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We just don't have it anymore. In fact, everybody's walking around now with a supercomputer in, in, their, uh, in their purse or on their belt. Right. And we, we just look at them and we call them, well, you know, it's a cell phone, but really it's, it's a supercomputer. Mm -hmm. The one you're carrying now is is about five times more powerful than the most expensive, fastest computer of 25 years ago, which uh, weighed, I think it was seven tons and had 60 miles of wires in it. Oh, wow. So, you know, big changes in the hardware. Mm -hmm. As the hardware changes, we need new ways of instructing it how to, how to work. And it's also the case that as we get more data and new ways of doing things, we need to find better ways of expressing it. We find some of the old ways don't work as well. Uh, it's why we still don't write in uh, Shakespearean uh, English. Uh -huh. <laughs> it isn't expressive for what we want to do. So language has evolved. Same thing with computer languages. They evolve to meet new applications and new needs. Uh, and that's part of the education that we have in computer science and computer security mm -hmm. is well, get the foundations so that we can evolve with it. If somebody right now who's graduating from Purdue University with a degree in computer science uh, may have a career of 40 years, let's say, from yeah. this point, 40 to 50 years. And if they only use what they learn now, uh, they're going to be obsolete in a decade. Oh because the things change so quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Students who are graduating this year, well, let me take that back. Students who are graduating next year can graduate with a degree in artificial intelligence that when they entered as a freshman didn't exist. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So, yeah. so the, the important thing that we try to convey here is this is a really dynamic field. Let's learn some fundamentals so that, as I said earlier, it, it's always learning. Mm -hmm. it's, it's adapting to something new. That's part of the excitement of this is who's going to think of something new next and how am I going to be able to use that? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, two is, more. Uh, I got to go to okay, so okay. sure. you. You've mentioned a few times that um, problem solving is kind of a, a, a lot of at the heart of this. And, and I can see that especially, right? Because, you know, like you said, they're going to graduate maybe in this next year with a degree that didn't exist when they started, um, when they started college problem solving, just, I know from having taught students is sometimes really challenging. It's not always, it's, they have to stop. They can't just memorize an answer. Sometimes you really have to think critically about how you might go about this. What's the best, how can you practice? How can you improve your problem solving skills? Do you have any tips for that? That's a great question. And I'll say that not everybody is good at solving new problems. You don't have to have that as a skill set okay. for all of the jobs in cybersecurity. People who are really good at following recipes, mm -hmm. at, at, at building things consistently again and again, lots of job opportunities for them. They don't have to solve new problems necessarily. Um, so it, it, uh, for anybody who is, is listening who uh, doesn't like puzzles or maybe isn't good at them, that doesn't mean they can't be involved here. Okay. It, it's just there. that's where some of the more um, uh, interesting aspects of, mm -hmm. of this can be. As far as building on problem-solving skills, uh, I have found that it's very much like working with math or language mm -hmm. or music, you need to practice. You need to encounter different kinds of puzzles. Mm -hmm. There are books, there are websites, there are others that have 
called brain teasers or puzzles. But to look at those and try those and see what the techniques are, people can get better with that. But they, they, it's like math, really. Some people seem to have a natural aptitude. Mm -hmm. And people who don't take to it right away shouldn't say that they're not good at math. I agree. Yeah. Because everybody can be good at math. Yes. It's just how much practice that they have to put in. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true of solving problems. Everybody actually has some ability to solve problems because that's life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. You know, where am I going to get lunch? Uh, yeah, right. My shoelace broke. How am I going to fix that? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are problems, but the kinds of problems I'm talking about involve a little bit more thinking and practice helps with that. Um, Really, I, I think it's true that everybody has certain aptitudes that they could they could say, oh, you know, somebody's really good at that. Maybe they're really good at, at uh, playing ball or playing music or solving a math problem. That's great. But if they want to do more than that, they really are going to need to practice. And that's that's a big part of uh, growing up and being being uh, an adult at, mm -hmm. at some point is, well, we got to practice things. I like that. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll just ask one or my two. Okay. Um, I don't want to drag you out on too. No. So I'll ask one of them. Uh, you can ask both. Okay, well, both are, well, okay, the one I wasn't going to ask, I'll ask it first then. <laughs> How is quantum computing changing your world? Quantum computing is not really changing things much now. And in part, that's because we don't really have powerful enough quantum computers. Okay. So uh, quantum is kind of a difficult concept to uh, wrap our heads around a little bit because most current computing, or really all current computing, when, when we run a calculation, we get an answer out. It's a definite answer. And at every step along the way, we have a definite answer. Mm -hmm. When you add one plus one, you get two, and you add one more and you get three and three. So quantum gives us the ability using some uh, exotic physics to run a whole bunch of calculations all together and we don't know the result until the end when we look at it. And so we could do, for instance, a search and it searches all possible combinations, but we don't have the answer until we look and then it all settles out to what the, the answer is. Uh, it's an exciting concept if it can be made to work on large scale problems. Okay. And that's where a lot of research is going on right now. Where that may change things is some of the tools that we use uh, where it's computationally difficult for an attacker to guess a password, for instance, mm -hmm. could be short circuited by quantum computing. Uh, but we've already started to develop new ways of doing that, that even quantum computing won't be able to uh, address. So it's not changing things yet. Could be a big deal in another decade. Okay. But nobody's certain that we're going to get to that point because there, there's a lot of uncertainty about how the technology works. Fair enough. We're not sure we're going to find dark matter either. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, we may find it, but we don't know what it is. Yeah, exactly. yeah, right, yeah. I mean, it's the, <laughs> All right, so yeah. the question I was going to ask, which is uh, maybe a little out of the box, uh, you said that next year students here at Purdue can graduate with a degree or a minor, uh, a minor in... Uh, no, it's a degree. Okay, degree in... Um, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, which is something that didn't exist when they started school. And so, I, and I'm asking you this not as just you, but now you are representing all of CS and possibly the field of computer science. How in the world can you guys stay up? I mean, it's like you're 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 right there at the edge. This is what's happening because you're teaching the people to do this. The people that are developing this, you're the one teaching them. How are you staying at the cutting edge to be able to teach people something that evolves every minute? <clears throat> the way that we keep current with all of this is we're the ones inventing it. If you think about 
what we do here at Purdue, not just in computer science, but in all the other disciplines, chemistry and physics and agronomy and, and the other areas, we're inventing that future. The faculty and the students are doing the research, they're doing the studies and writing the papers that are used by others to advance the field. As a result, our students get the benefit of being in classes with the people who are inventing all of this, who are discovering the new things, and that's how they pick it up. Our goal is to increase the knowledge, increase the background, and then our students will go on and take on those roles to move forward with the new discoveries. And that's how we keep up. It's also the case, though, that in computer sciences, for instance, I'm one of about 80 faculty, and there's no way any of us can keep current with everything that's going on. <laughs> it's simply too much. Yeah. But I'm in a community where there are people who know about this. So if I have a question, I can go to one of my colleagues and I can say, could you explain this to me? And they can give me a book or a paper or explain it to me or tell me to go away. And that's how I can learn about it. As a group, we stay ahead of this. As a, as a group, we solve problems as well as as individuals. But that's the benefit for students coming here to Purdue is they get immersed in that kind of environment where they can learn those things. It is it. Is that because we're an R1 institution where they, everyone's really they're research focused? I would say any research university has that kind of benefit. It's a question of how intense the research is and what areas they are. Purdue is certainly one of the top universities where we cover a lot of material at the very, very edge. But even some of the smaller research universities, mm -hmm. faculty are involved in research, staying current with material and teaching your students. That, that's one of the ideas behind the US university system where we have faculty who do both research and teaching mm -hmm. is to enrich that classroom experience for students. Okay. It, it's, I, because yeah, it's that, how do people know it? Well, they right. learn it from the people who are discovering it. Absolutely. That's yeah. awesome. We have, I mean, there's the idea, there's a, there's a, a great word, it's called autodidact, and that's where somebody can teach themselves by reading or performing their own experiments. Very small number of people are good at that, at, at being autodidacts. That's, that's a, a very special skill. That's why we have classrooms and instructors and laboratories, is because we've developed a procedure for conveying information to people without them having to go through the pain of learning it on their own. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That is. Well, thank you for your time. We appreciate you taking time, sitting down, chatting with us. Sure, and, uh, my pleasure. Like I said, I'm still as excited that the fact that the simplest answer and the most wow answer to me yeah. is we are creating that here. That's right. Here. We are the creating the future. Important. That's how we yeah. could yeah. teach the future. Uh, yeah, I think, well, you know, that's a message we want to get across to the students, um, that they can be part of discovery. Students can be part of inventing the future. Maybe they'll do it on their own accidentally if they don't come to Purdue or they go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But the best way to be sure that they're part of that effort is to get a good education. And that's certainly something we can do here in a number of areas. So if they are interested in being part of that, that future, inventing that future, rather than just having a job, they really ought to think about a college education. And this is a good place to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to this episode of Science from the Experts from Purdue University Superheroes of Science. If you like this episode, subscribe, give us a positive view, and share the love. Boiler up! Hammer down!